transition of heads and to some extent transition of chairs. You probably never want to have a head transition and a chair transition at the same time. I would say the most dangerous time for a school is when you change heads and the second most dangerous is when you change chairs. So I'm going to show this PowerPoint and I'll talk us through it. Let me know if you can see it. Can everybody see that? I hope. Uh, I can never make the left-hand panel go away, so we'll just hope you can see enough of what I'm looking at. Transition of heads and board chairs and anticipating and avoiding the pitfalls. Okay, the transition period is one to three years. It's sometimes as long as five for a new head. The length of the transition is unrelated to the new head's level of experience. The initial political capital that a new head coming in is zero. The goal really is in your first year, and this is hard to tell the board members, but in your first year, you should lay low. Don't fire anybody. Don't change any workload issues. Don't change the curriculum. Don't do anything of an initiative sort that makes faculty feel uncomfortable in your first year. Uh, if you choose an insider as head, you have a greater capacity to make some changes, but 90% of all schools choose outsiders, only 10% choose insiders, so we'll come back to that. So as I said, 90% of searches choose uh, outsiders, 80% are fired in the first five years, only 10% choose insiders, and only 10% of them are fired. So for those of you on screen who are heads of school who were promoted from within, you probably had a safer beginning and maybe a safer tenure. People who come into the school from the outside, even if you are experienced heads, start off with no political capital and have to be very careful how fast you move and on what topics you move. If you're an internally appointed candidate, you may still have issues, but usually not the core ones. By the way, remember that 60% of all heads of schools are fired because of board turnover the loss of institutional memory. And about 30% of the time heads are fired, it's because a new head comes in from the outside and undertakes a pace of change or a type of change which the faculty resent. And they then undercut the head with the parents and with the board, even though the board may have asked the head to do those very things. What are the factors that affect a head transition? One is the length of service of the prior head. The longer the prior head has served, the more challenging it is for the new head. Oftentimes, the new head following a long-term head is called the sacrificial lamb or the middleman because they tend to last no more than two or three years. If the prior head was only there three to five years and didn't have great experience, then the incoming head has a reasonable chance not to be undercut by the prior head. Another factor that affects head transition is the tenure and culture of the faculty. How long serving are they? How old are they? How resistant to change are they? You know, an, a faculty with an average age of 45 to 50, that's a senior faculty, and which might be a little more resistant to change. Uh, it also depends on the issues mandating gradual or immediate change. And the fact that boards tend to choose a head who is polar opposite from the previous head in style. That's not really what is healthy for the school, but boards fall into that trap no matter what, no matter what kind of advice their search firm gives them. The search committees always tend to choose someone whose style is a polar opposite to the person who left. And by the way, I was working with a new head of school today. Oh, he's not new. He's been in the job three or four years, but he replaced the long-term 20 year veteran head of school. And he's a good guy and he's doing good work in this new job, but he couldn't quite resist telling me all the problems he found under the carpet from the previous head and how effectively he had solved those problems in the past five years. The thing that's dangerous about that is there's still people in the school who often still appreciate the previous head and that previous head may even live in the region. So it's never a really good idea for a new head, no matter how much truth there might be to what's under the carpet to talk very much about the problems of the prior head. Frequently overlooked is the transition committee. Every board that goes through a head search spends a lot of time and energy on the search and very little time on the transition. So I've always said there's three steps in hiring a new head. 
There's the search, which increasingly these days is 18 months. Searches take 18 months. Then there's the transition and then there's the succession. I don't believe succession occurs until you've been there five years or more. So the transition committee is supposed to ensure an adequate budget for transition expenses for the head and spouse and partner or, and children if there are any, have a seamless physical move, proper placement and smooth adjustment of school aged children, a meaningful role for the spouse and introduction to the local community. Now, I'm just gonna be honest with you. We just did a search for a school. I won't tell you where, so I don't wanna give up the information, but I just got a note from, um, I don't want you to see this. I just want me to see this. I just got a note from the uh, chair of the search committee that um, brought the head and he said, I wanted to let you know, we are midway into the new head's initial visit with us here, even though she doesn't start until July of 23. The purpose of this visit was for her to orient herself with the school, our culture and the city. We put together a comprehensive meeting schedule that allows her to spend 30 minutes each with each of the key leadership team, school principals, admin and other stakeholders. We have an afternoon for her and her husband to visit homes in the area so they have a good understanding and view of what their accommodations will be like in a year's time when they arrive. They have one day for a cultural sightseeing visit with a professional guide. I've invited them home for dinner at my home, which includes many of our friends, which are also school parents. I've let them know this is intended as a casual evening for them to relax and just get a good social sense of the town. There's a formal dinner with the board, so each of our members has some time to spend with the new head. On Friday afternoon, my wife and, and I will be taking them out to show some of the local shops where they can buy groceries, cafes, et cetera. So far, feedback on her is what we have exceeded. We have already exceeded our already high expectations. She also thinks we're fantastic in terms of facilities, teaching staff, admin, the community, and the city. Both she and her husband have shown great enthusiasm for the school and the city. I'm very optimistic. The reason I read you that is I think that's great. I think that um, having that occur now, you know, a year plus before she arrives uh, is wonderful. So I'm gonna bring you back to the screen because I ended up stop sharing the main screen. Okay. So the transition committee ensures proper placement, meaningful role for spouse and introduction to the local community. Another issue, they identify pitfalls and danger zones. The transition committee is really looking to advise you about the invisible board of key players that may lie below the surface or in the history of the school. They let you know what the politics are within the school culture. They let you know what the faculty grievances and personalities are, sometimes buried in the weeds. They let you know what the past incidents or history are that a new head should know about or avoid. Don't step in a mud pile because nobody told you about it. What the head and board must avoid. Too many or unrealistic goals. Too many changes. Don't fire anyone. Rapid pace of change, raising staff and faculty anxiety about change, alienating long-term teachers, loss of key administrators and faculty. By the way, new heads who come in sometimes have two or three senior administrators leave shortly after they arrive, not necessarily because they wanted them to leave, but that's a bad signal to the parent body and to the faculty. Even though heads ultimately want their own team in place, too many key administrators leading, leaving too fast is going to be seen as a negative. Also, you don't want chair and board turnover in the first two or three years. And of course, sometimes some international schools have constant board turnover, which is a whole nother issue. Threatening changes by or to new head, change of salary structure, introduction of performance pay, introduction of credible teacher evaluation teaching schedule modifications, workload changes, departure of a key administrator or teacher, rumor that one or more staff were fired, someone researching your prior history and decisions on any public forums. I'll give you an example, one school head in East Asia who was uh, hired by another really good school in East Asia had a disgruntled former teacher from his former school name unknown, of course, who posted on one of the rag sheets on the internet 
some very negative things about this head. And before you know it, well, somebody's got their mic on with all the background noise. Could you put it on mute, please? Excuse me, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Not much we can do when got all that background noise. Okay, let me get back to this. Um, so the story was about this head who had planned to go to this new job and a teacher from his prior school, unbeknownst to him, we don't know who the teacher was, he doesn't know who the teacher was, posted this very negative story about him, which then caused the new school pause in having him come and take over the post as head of the school. Uh, it turned out all right in the long run, but it was very threatening to that head. So be careful that you know what's out there. Other pitfalls, avoid major strategic initiative using a broad-based approach. In fact, don't undertake any strategic planning in your first year as a new head, simply because among other reasons, the faculty know you don't know them yet. They know you don't know the mission yet, unless you're an internally hired head. They know you're in fact not familiar with the culture. So having you undertake a strategic plan and even lead it in your first year is very risky. Avoid any real or perceived changes to the mission or the vision. <laughs> or even to the, uh, the motto or to the, uh, uh, the whatever you use to represent the school online. Just be sure that you're not putting your brand on it too soon. You don't want an entirely new academic leadership team. You need some people inherited from the prior one. Employing your spouse. Now, this is always a sensitive one. Many heads of schools go abroad, a man or a woman, and there's often no chance for your spouse to be employed in that country either due to local laws or from lack of an opportunity. So most international school heads do have their spouse employed in the school. If you're gonna do that, you clarify that with the board and the board chair. You always make sure you're not the direct supervisor of your spouse. And even then there's gonna be challenges. And frankly, the challenges are gonna be mostly those faced by your spouse. It's a very tough role. Be careful about clashing early with a strong-willed board member or I should say a strong-willed faculty member, uh, falling into the midst of a dysfunctional or factional board, and you don't want to find yourself in any one of those factions, and stakeholder discontent, even if you did not cause it. Good example would be the pandemic. Many, many parents in, in your part of the world were unhappy that they could not get on campus, not only when time was remote, but even when the cat, kids were back in school, uh, many schools in China and elsewhere in the Far East, the parents were not allowed on site. That caused a disconnect between the parent body and the faculty and the parent body and the administration. And frankly, I think causes and still is causing a lot of dysfunction. It's going to take a while for that to heal. Um, how does a head build political capital? Either a new head or a head who's been around for a few years. You have to cultivate a relationship with each trustee or board member, whatever you call them, a director, a board member, a trustee. I've mentioned to a number of you before that there's three partnerships. The head chair partnership is number one. The head partnership with each board member is number two. And the chair's partnership with each board member is number three. It's really important that every head of school has two or three meetings a year with every board member in their office and ask them three questions. How am I doing as head, just informally? It's not my formal evaluation. How are you doing as a board member in terms of making a difference? Do you feel appropriately engaged? And if you have kids in the school, how are your kids doing? Not that you want them to leverage you on behalf of their children, but you need politically to know if their children are suffering. You also want to cultivate the loyalty of the senior management team. Sometimes one or more members of that team were candidates for your job. In fact, they may have been informal candidates, not even formal ones, but they wanted your job. So you always have to have eyes in the back of your head when you're an outside head who comes into a school where there were previous members of the staff seeking the job. Build relationships with long-term faculty. What I always think is a good idea is to find soon who are the most highly respected, 
long-term teachers and build personal relationships with them. Don't form an advisory committee. Don't get into the committee business, just a personal relationship with a few long-term teachers who can tell you what's going on before anybody else may tell you. At one of my schools, for example, where I had a very, very long-term faculty, one fellow who I really enjoyed, he and I played golf together fairly regularly. And he used to stand up in faculty meetings and he used to be the devil's advocate calling out something that he knew was going on among the faculty and he wanted me to know it. So he would say it publicly in front of a faculty meeting, sometimes wink, sometimes not wink, but he was basically saying, this is an issue, you need to address it. He would actually come down to my secretary sometimes and say, tell John, we have to go out and play golf. But what he meant was he wanted to go out on a nine hole golf course and tell me what was going on in the culture. You have to build a coalition of support within the staff. If possible, learn the names of the children. Now, if you're a very large school of 1,000, 1,500, I know that's hard. Get, get picture face cards. It's hugely, hugely important to know the name of the children, the first names. If you go by a child in the hallway and you know that child's name and you say, hi, George, or hi, whoever, they will go home and tell their mom that the head of school knew their name. That is crucial. Know the personal circumstances of the faculty and staff. Again, this is how you really need to start building political capital in your first few years. Think about it this way. Not long ago, I was talking with a teacher whose head had just fired somebody. And I asked the teacher how he felt about that. And he said, well, I like this person. They were a friend of mine. I was upset when they were fired. But frankly, I want to give the head the benefit of the doubt so I will assume that what he did, he had to do. Well, if you're a fairly new head, that's not a bad answer for a teacher to give. How does the board support the new head and provide support and political capital? Governs according to the principles of good practice in board governance, and there's about 21 of them. I believe those 21 principles of good practice are crucial for boards to know because about eight of them are like the gospel of the New and Old Testament or whatever religion you belong to. They are so crucial, they should be up on a placard in the boardroom. Set manageable goals for the head. In fact, I would say that for the head's first year, there are no goals. For the head's first year, the only goal ought to be survive, have a good transition year, make a lot of friends, don't make a lot of enemies, build political capital, but don't give yourself a bunch of goals because you're a masochist and don't let the board set a lot of goals for you in your first year. Use an appropriate annual goal setting process as part of your head evaluation. And in my mind, that is a small committee of the chair and maybe two others who meet with the head in the spring of the year and go over maybe three to five goals. This is not the first year, this should be the second or third year. And then those goals are approved at the, maybe at the August meeting of the full board and then the head begins to work on those goals. And then maybe mid-year, the committee meets with the head to see how things are going, give us some updates. Then in the spring of the year, all the board members individually and confidentially evaluate the head according to those goals and sign their evaluation and send it to the chair who tabulates it. And the head does his or her own self-evaluation and then meets with the committee and the committee looks at what the head said about himself or herself and what the uh, board said about the person collectively. Out of that comes a two page summary that goes into the file that's written by the chair and that has commendations for work well done and recommendations for work still needing to be done. If you do that, you tick all of the important boxes for doing an appropriate due process head evaluation approach. I don't believe you should use 360 but I do believe that there are about 15 indices of success that over time, maybe a five-year period, if most of these are ticking upward and I'm not including a pandemic, these 15 indices of success will indicate how the head is doing. And they're commonsensical, you would know what they are. I mean, a balanced budget, retention of staff, low attrition of kids, enrollment demand, uh, perhaps fundraising, kids do well when they leave and go elsewhere, strong parent and community support, reputation in the community. There's a lot of them that you hope a good head, a strong head over the years will address, but I don't think you need 360, and I'll just make this short because most of you heard me say this before,
But the concept of 360 is a corporate one. And no corporate CEO has board members whose children are influenced by the CEO's employees. But heads have board members whose children are influenced by the head's employees, i.e. the teachers. Totally different world. Um, the board needs to support the head publicly and privately. The chair of the board needs to be the, big, the head's biggest public advocate and most honest private critic. Avoid executive session. I know some board members tell me that it's better if we go into executive session every single month, then the head is not so threatened uh, by the process. I don't believe that at all, and heads don't tell me that. Executive session every month where the board goes into a meeting without the head is usually destructive, uninformed, <clears throat> also with <clears throat> misinformation going around, and it really undercuts the bond between the head of school and the board. In the transition process, avoid the middleman scenario. Now, if you have a long-term head, <clears throat> I mean a really long-term head, and there's not many international schools that do, but if you do, it might be a better idea to have an interim head for a year and then do the search to hire the new head. Because otherwise, the next head after a long-term one is that middleman scenario. How does the Committee on Trustees support the head? So the Committee on Trustees is the US term, and the term you may use overseas is governance committee, policy committee, nominating committee. But I believe all of those functions fall within one committee. So the nomination process, the screening process, the evaluation process, uh, the training process, all of that falls under the board's governance committee. I'll come back to that in a minute. You want the board to minimize board turnover. I was talking with an international school head today from the Middle East. He has been in the job five years. He has 12 board members and there's only one left who was on the board when he was hired by the search committee six years ago. One of the 12 left. Total loss of institutional memory. So the governance committee has to help structure the board, structure the bylaws, structure the articles of incorporation such that there is institutional stability. Now, if you're a privately owned school, if you're owned by a corporation, if you're owned by a entrepreneurial business person, it's a whole different set of rules. But if you are a nonprofit board with board members who are either elected or appointed, you want to be sure that you have some institutional memory over time and not everybody leaves at the same time. So this governance committee also should watch for behaviors that may undermine the head. You want to have longer serving chairs. I mean, folks, there is so much proof. Long-term boards lead to long-term chairs, which lead to long-term heads, which lead to stronger schools, better finances, better reputation, better enrollment, better mission integrity. And the opposite is true. Short-term boards with short-term chairs have short-term heads, which lead to constant searches, transitions, instability, power vacuums, turnover, lack of financial strength and damage to reputation. <laughs> so the logic is keep your board members longer, keep your chairs longer, keep your heads longer, as long as you're doing regular annual evaluation. When I say that, a lot of board members will say to me, well, listen, we need new blood on the board. And I say, yes, but you don't need blood on the floor. You don't want a regular massacre, which often occurs when you've lost board institutional memory. So provide for longer serving chairs. I'd say at least three to five years. Provide annual governance training. I don't care how good a board you have, everybody needs annual governance training. And then the eight key roles of the governance committee, I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about them. If you wanna write them down, might not be a bad idea. Number one, cultivate a pool of prospects. Even if you have a parent elected board, still cautiously, subtly, cultivate a pool of prospects of potential future board members. And don't let them know they're being cultivated for that purpose. As far as they're concerned, you might simply be making friends, or maybe you're gonna ask them to help in some way with the school, but cultivate a pool of prospects. That's number one for this committee. Number two is screen and vet those prospects. And by that, I mean, be sure you know, are they a one issue candidate? 
Do they want to fire the math chair? Is there a big issue uh, soccer? Is their spouse going to be a problem? You want to carefully vet and scrutinize them before they're invited to serve. So that's number two. Number three is invitation. Sounds simple, but it's not. Invitation is when the chair of the board and the chair of the governance committee go to that person and say, would you like to serve on the board? We have three questions for you. Are you willing to give us the time for board meetings and committee meetings? Number two, are you willing to support the school and its financial needs? And number three, and most important, if you're a current parent, do you realize by joining the board, you're gaining influence over the mission of the school, but you're losing influence over the daily education of your child? Now, there may be a lot of board members who are, at that point will say, what? No way. I'm not joining this board and losing influence over the education of my child. But in point of fact, you ought to say that because every parent board member is in an automatic conflict of interest. And a lot of parents who are not on the board think you're getting paid or you're getting some sort of deal or guanxi or something is going on for you to be a board member. So you have to be very careful that you don't advocate for your child inappropriately as a board member. So again, the governance committee oversees cultivation, screening, invitation, and number four is orientation. I was working with a school and I won't say, but it was in China, not many years ago, school was 25 years old and I wrote about 13 board members in the room and all of them were there five years or less, except for one who was one of the founders from 25 years before. And I really believe the most important part of orientation is not just the articles and the bylaws and how do the various offices function, but what happened in our history? So one of my frequent questions is, can you name the last eight or 10 heads of the school? Can you name the last three or four board chairs of the school? Oh, by the way, this is off, beef, off topic for a minute. I always ask board members on screen or whenever I'm with them, can you tell me the name of the head spouse? Can you tell me the name of the head's children and the grades they're in? Because if they can't all do that, they're not nurturing their head appropriately. And sometimes none of them know those things except the board chair. So orientation, this story I was telling you, I asked this long-term board member, how many heads had there been at the school in 25 years? He said seven. And I said, how many of them were fired or did not leave by choice? And he said, seven. And the whole boardroom just gasped. And I said, can I ask why? And he said, how confidential is this? And I said, well, it's the board meeting. It's up to you. So he said, well, I'd say all of them were fired. And there was another gasp. And I said, can you tell me, was that the right decision or the wrong decision? And can you give me the specifics? And he said, how confidential is this? And I said, well, same answer as before. He said about half of them should not have been fired. It was a board mistake, board misbehavior, and they shouldn't have been let go. So there are some lessons learned in that orientation process. Those who forget the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. Okay, now we're getting more difficult. After, uh, after orientation comes board training, which should be annual. And then comes one of the most difficult ones. This board or this committee is charged with evaluation of the chair evaluation of the board collectively as a group of themselves, evaluation of each member of the board doing a self-review, and most challenging, evaluating any board member whose term is up for renewal as to whether or not they're doing their job. Are they showing up? Are they violating confidences? Are they in fact self-advocating for their child too much? All of these things might be issues about whether or not they should be invited to serve another term. But of course, it's very difficult for board members to hold their fellow board members accountable. And it's very, very hard to chastise, even in a friendly or humorous way, a fellow board member who's breaking the rules. But I'm an advocate that there should be no term limits for board members. Let me back that up. No term limits for board members if they have a governance committee that does all eight of the functions I'm talking about which I have to be perfectly honest, I've never seen a board actually do all eight well. So I guess you have to have term limits, but I would have longer term limits and have some exceptions. Like if you're an officer of the board 
As long as you're an officer, you're timed out from your term limits. So the last two jobs of this committee are warning a board member of misbehavior and removing a board member for continued misbehavior. Now, I'm gonna tell you a joke some of you may have heard before, but I think it's worth telling uh, about one of my boards, uh, elementary day school, where people were getting really upset that one board member misses every other meeting and then wants to have everything repeated from the previous meeting. And at the board meeting I was attending, they were all sitting around a table, which was rectangular. You could hit somebody else's feet under the table if you weren't careful. But somebody said the next time George comes and wants to repeat something that we all went over at the previous meeting, would somebody just kick him in the shins? And everybody laughed, assuming that would never happen. But at the next board meeting, George showed up and he looked at the document in front of everybody, which was a policy change. And he said, when did we talk about this? And the whole room went silent. And then a woman who was sitting opposite him who had a particularly pointed pair of shoes that day, reached up with her foot in the attempt to kick him in the shins, but she kicked him in the kneecap instead, must have hurt like hell, because he hurt, he jumped up, knocked all the coffee and all the water off the tables, everybody broke out laughing, but the moral of the story is when he said, what is this all about? And they told him, the moral of the story is what he said in return. He said, couldn't you have just told me? Board members have a very hard time just telling each other about what they need to do. <clears throat> so we've gone over that. These are all issues about how to keep the board strong and keep the head in place. There's also the importance of minimizing board chair turnover. Most international school heads do not survive their third board chair. And that's because that chair wasn't even on the board when they were hired, has no idea of what their accomplishments were. And I always say to board members, how many of you can survive three marriages? Every head of school and chair is a marriage. You have to get to know each other, trust each other, no surprises. Every time you change chair, <clears throat> chairs, you threaten to overturn the head. You threaten that the head cannot survive the next chair. Now, some heads are very politically good at this. They're real survivors. But I remember when I was speaking with a group of ASSA, A-A-S-S-A from the Latin American group <clears throat> some years ago, um, and some of you may remember the name Phil Jocelyn. He was at the Lincoln School in Argentina. There were about uh, 60 or 70 school heads in the audience. And I asked if any of them had been the head of their current school 15 years or more, and only two of them raised their hand. And I asked both of them how many board chairs they had. I think Phil told me he had two, and the other person said he had two. I think that's the reason they were still there. Not that they weren't good, but board turnover and chair turnover is very dangerous. The importance of the head board chair relationship is, you know, you want to ensure a good match between the head and chair. You want to honor the head's preferences for the chair, but by the way, if the head does not want a specific person on the board to be the chair, be very careful who you say that to heads because that person may become the chair. Anticipate style differences between the new and the prior board chair. There is no magic number to the board chair's tenure. Remember the three partnerships, head chair, chair and board, and head and board, which means not only does the head need to know every board member, but the chair needs to know and talk to and ensure a good relationship with every board member. The politics of chair change, and then this affects head transition. It's not a democratic process. The head, the current chair, and the chair of the governance committee measure the field, that is, who could do this job. You avoid someone who wants the role too much. Important, if the person really wants the role, you don't want them in the job. Assess the reason why that candidate may wish to be chair. Ensure that the chair can both listen and lead. Ensure that the board annually evaluates the head, the chair on itself, and devote the time to that process. I've gone overhead evaluation earlier. I'll just leave this up here for you to look at because it's what I basically said a while back. <clears throat> Test the waters. The chair needs to ensure he or she is leading effectively. The head chair partnership is key. If too distant, 80% of the governance channels will result and the head is the often first fired. In other words, 
of governance issues that may lead to the head's departure is usually a fallout between the chair and the head. However, if the head chair partnership is too close, then 20% of the governance issues are resulting from a jealousy of the rest of the board members who feel that the head is too close to the chair and the head is not receiving appropriate critical feedback. And the head chair partnership requires the rule of no surprises, do not shock each other. Okay, stopping sharing. <clears throat> Any questions from anybody on what I've said so far? No questions. Can't believe I didn't elicit something. You can take yourself off mute if you wish to ask any questions. Okay, and we're gonna do a case. Oh, sorry, Steve, get your hand up. Yeah, uh, John, my question is how many times have you actually uh, seen a governance committee or a board uh, sanction or remove a member for poor behavior? Uh, good question. I was working with an international school in Europe five years ago, and I said everything to that board of nine parent elected board members. <clears throat> and the board chair said, well, this is very interesting because I just had to remove two parent elected board members last May. And I said, well, how can you do that given the fact they were all elected by the parents? And he said, because we require every year that every board member signs a confidentiality agreement. And every year you sign a no conflict of interest agreement. And we wanted to get a piece of land adjacent to the school. We wanted to buy it from a couple of neighbors, but we needed the municipality's permission. And at a cocktail party, two of the board members leaked this information to people who were connected to the municipal people. They got wind of it. A lot of neighbors complained. In other words, we were blocked from buying the land. I found out which two board members did that. I went to see each of them and showed them the document they had signed. And I said, I want your resignation. And I got it. I said, wow, you're tough. He said, damn right. You can't be the chair of a board and keep the school healthy and allow that kind of thing to happen. So yeah, I've seen that happen. Not often, but once in a while. Yes, Jason. Uh, you use the term long-term head. And I just wondered if you've got a, and a range of how many years makes a person quote a long-term head? 12 to 15 years. I think five year heads, five years is the average tenure of an American independent school head. In Canada, it's more like six and a half. And on the international circuit, it's three and a half. I believe that three and a half, four and a half, five, even six or seven are not long-term heads. You basically don't leave a legacy because the person who comes behind you will change everything you did. If you've been there 12 or 15 years, you've really gotten to know all the kids, all the parents, all the faculty. You've hired teachers who share your common definition of the mission. I find one of the strangest things at international schools is when I go in and do faculty comp work and I interview the teachers, they all have a different definition of the mission depending upon which head hired them. The one eight years ago, the one seven years ago, the one five years ago, the one three years ago, and every new head who comes in wants a new evaluation process, so the teachers are totally cynical about it. So, yeah, and you know, we need some long-term heads. I mean, we've had a few. There are some heads out there right now who've been at their school. In fact, Julia, how long has uh, Laurie been at Nanjing? Uh, 13 years now. And he had a full year sabbatical, right? Yes which probably enabled him to come back and survive and be a good leader after that. So I had a full year sabbatical by my board, fully paid. And I came back for four more years after it. I was gone. I was there eight years, went away for a year and came back four more years. And I guarantee you, I learned a lot. I became a better head of school, but that allowed me to stay long. In the United States, we used to have 35 and 45 year heads. Now we have a few who have been around 16 to 25 years. But internationally, there are some heads who are still in, in their seats after 15 years, but it's rare, Jason. Any other questions? Uh, John, uh, Gary Biondo Gary? here from hey, Mongolia. I, I just want to apologize. I need to step out of the meeting now. Um, ISU great. is celebrating their 30th anniversary today. So um, okay. I'm 
heading to the uh, the ballroom or to the uh, the conference center to hand out some awards. But thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction today. And uh, apologies to everyone that I need to step out of the meeting at this point. But it, it, is our, it is our 30th anniversary. So and, and nice to see you, John. I hope to see you in October. Thank you very much, Gary. Have a good okay. evening. Good morning. John, John, Andy, quick question. Andy, go ahead, Andy. Andy Richter here. Uh, John, you've mentioned that there's a tendency that board choose uh, a new head that is opposite in style from the previous head. And it sounded more like it was a negative. Um, but I mean, the needs of schools change over time, you know, so so um, I rather look at it as a positive. Could you elaborate on that? Um, yeah, well, first of all, I think most heads, most heads were once teachers. And most teachers, when they became heads, did not know how to manage finances or enrollment or managing boards or manage strategic planning. They had to learn all of that. So every head of school over time hopefully improves their skill set and becomes more and more sophisticated at what they do. But by polar opposites, I mean, if you have a head who is what I would call hail fellow well met, very effervescent, often out in the community, often engaging with people constantly, but oftentimes not knowing the names of the kids, not really being down familiar with the curriculum, not knowing the faculty that well, but being more of an outside person, the board will tend to hire an inside person as the next head, someone who's more focused on faculty and curriculum, but then people will begin to notice that that person doesn't have those outside sets of skills. So I just think you don't need a polar opposite person replacing the person who left. You probably need the pendulum to come someplace in center. So yes, everybody will be different than the previous person and should be, but I don't need to know that they should be dramatically different in style. Good point. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, Ed, can you put the case in the chat or shall I read it? It's not a complicated, long case. Yeah, I have uh, sent it just now in the chat. Can everybody look at people it? To read it and, but we can, you can read it out loud while they read along with you. Yeah, why don't you guys <clears throat> look at the chat if you can figure out where it is here. Uh, yeah, I see where he did. He put it in the chat. It's called Board Governance Transition Case. Can everybody see it? So while you're looking for it, I'm going to read it out loud. Okay, this is a true case. Isn't that old? <clears throat> Perry School Board Governance Case. A very experienced head of school has been the head of Perry for seven years. Perry is another one of the very successful schools that he has led during his distinguished career. During his tenure at Perry, Perry has increased its stature as one of the preeminent schools in this large cosmopolitan city in which it's located. The head spearheaded a 35 million building project, maintained the school's reputation for academic excellence, and handled very well some tragedies that shocked the school community. The head has also managed relations with his sophisticated board well. His board chair, a very successful businessman who travels extensively, is suddenly transferred and is replaced by a board member who is expected to succeed in the role. Shortly after the new chair takes over her responsibilities, the head receives a phone call from the search firm that placed the head in his current position. The consultant for the firm asks the head if it's true that he's intending to leave because the new chair had recently contacted the search consultant about retaining his services. The head is completely surprised and dismayed. The only additional information I will give you is that the person who was supposed to be the chair at the last minute decided she couldn't. And so the board chose this other person as chair. That's not the case. You guys don't have the Perry case in front of you? Carlisle Board Governments and Transition. Well, you have Carlisle. Oh, I thought we were doing Perry. Okay, well, this Perry might be more interesting. But let me go to yours <laughs> since Ed and I did not get our act together on that one. Let me pull it up. Okay, Natalie, why don't you read the case out loud so I've got the right one. Carlisle, go ahead. And maybe you'd like to do Perry second. Natalie, you're on mute. 
Yes. The head of Carlisle School has announced his retirement, but it appears that he is having thoughts about his legacy and feels that a loyal internal candidate could be the best choice as his successor. The internal candidate will follow in his footsteps and is unlikely to institute any radical changes to the status quo. The search committee, however, has a very strong pool of external candidates. They tell the internal candidate that she is no longer in the running for the headship and they choose a very qualified outsider. The historically strong relationship between the outgoing head and the board chair begins to deteriorate rapidly. The head does not hide his displeasure at the appointment of the outsider. He makes the minimum attempt to connect with the new head, does not involve him in any hiring decisions for the new school year, and resigns all the senior leadership to new contracts without consulting the new head. He badmouths the board and the chair to an accrediting agency. While this is happening, the chair is very busy with a career change. When the new head finally arrives, he receives no assistance in settling in and a tepid welcome from the community. The chair continues to support the new head as best she can. The outgoing head receives a lovely send-off and a generous retirement package, but leaves somewhat reluctantly. The chair is exhausted. There is still some loyalty on the board to the former head. What should the chair do now? What should the new head do? Okay, also a true case and probably a better one given the topic. So, um, Ed, do we should we split people out by what maybe half half of the group or maybe in four groups? How many people do we actually have in the room? Thirty. Um, let's say maybe three groups of ten. Can we do that? How many? Three groups of ten. And what I would suggest, folks. If you, uh, when you get to your breakout room, we'll give you, let's say, 20 minutes to discuss the case and answer the questions at the bottom, and also talk about what issues of board governance are transpiring here. And what I might suggest is if there's a head of school in the room, the head of school with the longest tenure, I'd ask be the facilitator. If there's no head of school in the room, if there's a chair instead, I'd ask the chair with the longest tenure to be the facilitator. We don't wanna waste a lot of time figuring out who's gonna be the facilitator, but I would like the facilitators to come back to the meeting and report back for their group on their findings of what should the head do, what should the chair do, and what are the core governance issues here. So everybody clear about what we're gonna do? 20 minutes, groups of 10, choose a facilitator, discuss the case, and then we'll bring you back in 20 minutes. Any questions? Okay, here we go. Okay, thanks, Ed. Uh, Ed, we have Joshua and Ira still sitting in the room. Ed, Certainly. can you? We have two people <clears throat> still sitting in the room here with us. Joshua and Ira, are you guys there? Ira's there. I can't join the breakout room. You know how to fix that, Ed? No. Hmm. Joshua, you in the same situation? Should be going on automatically. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> I know. Um, <clears throat> I've tried to move. 
So that I think I can't join another volleyball tournament, so don't worry about it. Don't seem to be moving. I don't know why. Uh, yeah. Um, let me see. I, I'm jumping around. The Okay, welcome back everybody. So we had three facilitators. We had, <clears throat> let me see, we had Julia, we had James and we had Andy, I think. So I'm gonna ask each of the facilitators very quickly to give me a summary of their conclusions about this case, including what should the board do now? And frankly, what can the new head do now? Um, so James, you wanna start, take a couple minutes. Sure. Uh, you know, we sort of looked at it as uh, that there were a number of missteps, um, uh, especially to your earlier point with regards to transition. Um, you know, where was that process to help? Um, and there were a number of big political decisions that were made, which maybe weren't properly um, developed and, and, and fostered, um, including, you know, why it was that somebody wasn't um, from the inside wasn't chosen or didn't, you know, move on to a finalist or so on and so forth. So the other part of it was kind of getting to the other side of it going, okay, well, what now? So, you know, where was the opportunity for that board chair to both a sort of, you know, take a moment, take a breather, get some outside support to reconceptualize this, um, think about some strategy and then come back um, partially at least renewed in their thinking as they began to take this on. What were the relationship building opportunities at the board level to kind of sort that all out and to the point of you're going to have loyalties, you're going to have a commitment to somebody that you've been doing this work with for years and years. That in and of itself isn't a problem, but then how do you then bring that back around to an understanding that all that being true, we also need to move forward and we have hired this new person to move the organization forward. Um, another piece that came out was, you know, where were those opportunities um, to allow that new person and support that new person in really listening deeply to their organization and trying to understand all the different um, places that stakeholder groups were in, parents and students and, and senior leadership team. Um, a lot of energy um, or, or some some of my discussion was about the focus on really the, the new head making time with that leadership team um, and getting in there and trying to win over some of that political capital and, and build those relationships. So the kind of the overall was the importance of, of relationship building, of listening, of also uh, rethinking, going forward, what would we do different? Um, what are some of the opportunities in system? Anybody from my group, is there anything I missed or that you would add? Okay, let's move on. James, thank you very much for that summary. Julia, what about your group? Different thoughts, same thoughts? Uh, similar thoughts, of course. I think we spent a lot of time thinking or, or talking about um, that very early on something went wrong, that it's one of the most important functions of a board to hire a director. And somehow this board seems to have uh, let the old head uh, take over too much um, in that process. So we talked a little bit about how how that should actually work if you have a transition, how much should the old 
a head of school be involved? Um, how healthy is that? And so we spend a lot of time around that issue, um, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and then, yes, moving forward um, in what James just said and rebuilding relationships and building trust and trying to look forward. And there was also the question of we weren't quite clear whether the old head was still in town <laughs> and if somebody would have to take on the role of having a word with him. Um, about <clears throat> stepping back so yeah the old head is still in town <laughs> okay thank you julia andy can you give us your thoughts yeah we we, we hoped um that the case study john was not a real life scenario you know um that that actually happened you know um i mean none, obviously, of, none of this is fake this has all happened <laughs> i mean obviously the the outgoing head lacked all common professional courtesy you know one would expect in a, in a transition period uh, he, he made um, every mistake one can do, um, but but clearly the damage was done. Um, there's not so much the board can do about this, but but since the board also um, is is not aligned and seems divided, um, our approach would be, you know, that that the board chair um, should remind the board, you know, that um, the hiring decision um, is a collective decision made by the board. Um, we don't know how they reached, you know, their their um, hiring decision, you know, if that was a majority decision, which we discussed, you know, would be unfortunate. It should be a, a consensus decision, of course. Um, but but reminding the board, you know, on, on, on the fact it is a collective decision and that has been made, you know, um, um, everyone should 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 um, uh, rally behind that decision and anyone who still has a issue, you know, or disagrees with the hiring decision should actually leave the board. Um, we, we also discussed a little, you know, how to unite a board, you know, um, which is, 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 is um, where we didn't really have, you know, um, a, a, a real answer. But but obviously, you know, here governance, you know, uh, principles come into place, you know, to 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 make sure the board, you know, comes back, you know, um, on a, on a functioning level. Um, so uniting the board, you know, was a, was the a most and important thing we we feel, you know, um, is, is is required, you know, in in a scenario like this. Um, other than that, um, we, we spend a little time on, on um, the decision making, the search process and, and how boards should um, 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 make a decision uh, whom to hire. And I indicated already, you know, um, um, we, 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 we um, all agree, you know, it should be a consensus decision, a majority based um, decision, you know, um, is, 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 is the worst, you know, you can imagine. Um, and that wouldn't be a good start for any new incoming head. Okay, well, the head still is in town. There was a consensus by the search committee on this candidate. Um, and the head of school changed colors totally. The head of school was one personality until he decided to retire. It was his decision to retire. He was exhausted from the pandemic. And yet one year into the pandemic, he suddenly decided what's what I wanna do after the pandemic. And uh, he suddenly realized, I don't really want to retire. But the search process had already started. He had already made his decision. It was clear that he was actually having doubts that he'd made the right decision. It was clear that he wanted the internal candidate to get the job because the internal candidate was loyal to him, had been appointed by him, and would probably look to him for guidance and support. Um, and I think the head just changed personalities. I mean, it was just an incredible, incredible shift. Um, so let me ask some other opinions around the room. Uh, Jason, what comments might you have that we haven't mentioned yet? Uh, I, I thought the main focus, I mean, the question was, what should they do now? Uh, the, the head of school just needs to work on building relationships and trust among not only the board chair but the board members and the whole leadership team they're in an uphill battle it looks like to me yep okay building political capital no question marina what do you think what can, what can we do now to turn this around i'm very sorry i didn't hear the last uh, five to ten minutes because my internet connection is very wobbly i've just heard like words don't worry about <laughs> it don't worry nothing about in it. between i'm sorry not i really i didn't hear anything. I was just fixing the connection. Sorry. Okay. Marina, don't forget anything we said. What do you think the board or the head should do now to turn things around? 
Oh, um, uh, okay. So um, I feel that it's really important to uh, say, uh, like to bring everyone together around the thought that the success of the head of school um, is the success of the whole school. And this is kind of, for me, the minimal common denominator uh, where everyone kind of should uh, sit around at, at that table. So um, I think this is the thought that we, the discussion should be started with. Um, and um, if that is clear, then I feel that most of the people will come, on, come aboard. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna go around really fast everybody and see if there's any other comments. Thanks, Marina. Marama, do you have anything you wanna add? I'm going to quote a fellow governor of mine who said, trust is the most important thing. Um, and I think that that's something that everyone needs to agree on and, and, and be, and, and no surprises going forward from the new head of school. But yeah, I think they need to build trust amongst everyone. The three relationships you mentioned, head, chair, um, head, board, chair, and their board, and um, the new head in the board. Yep. Okay, thanks, Marama. Annette, any thoughts? Uh, I know that it says the the chair is in the middle of a career change. Um, and so there's a lot of personal and professional things going on for them. However, their commitment and responsibility as a chair, they really need to spend a lot of time in building that relationship with uh, the new head and also pulling the board together. So I suggested that um, the chair have a weekend retreat, um, make contact with you, John, and <laughs> get some advice. <laughs> and, and then, uh, uh, spend a whole day with the board, uh, reminding them of the mission of the school and their roles and responsibility as a board. Okay, good point. Thank you. Jim, what about you? Any comments? I agree with Marama on uh, the three relationships should uh, begin to be sustained again. The chair should work hard at his part in uh, uh, building the board back up and inspiring trust and confidence. Uh, the head should also start to find a lot of relationship building within the school as well as uh, cultivating his own pool of prospects for future board members, perhaps. Oh, okay, thank you. Natalie, comments? And most of the things have already been mentioned, but I just want to reinforce the importance of the relationship between the head and the chair and the head and each and every board member. So in, in such a case, I would extremely advise the board chair and the head of school to get together with a plan and try to bring everyone on board and have a united board, a united front, and um, to be successful in such circumstances. It's going to be hard, but I will start by initiating one-to-one -one meetings, as you very well suggested, and um, with each and every board member, board, both with the board chair and both with the head of school individually, and try you know, to build that level of trust, which is so much needed for the success of the school. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, Joanne, anything before we go you'd like to add? Just that the board probably needs to work on some stakeholder management so that the parents and the staff are clear on what is the role of the board. If they are visible, transparent and accountable enough, then the school community should trust them in their choice of head of school. So something to work on in the future. Okay, thanks. Emerson? Yeah, just one point would be following up with others is the idea of positive presupposition from the new head and really going be that won't be natural, I would assume, but that really keeping that as a focus. Yep. Okay. Uh, Kathy, Endo, any thoughts? You're on mute, Kathy. Right. I think this relationship building will have to be the focus for the new school head and the, the chair. And as uh, many of you had said, with the various stakeholders within the board themselves and the parents, the students, the whole community, uh, the school head is starting in a very different uh, position starting the new academic year. So that really uh, needs to be the focus, which has been talked about in our group. Okay, thank you. Got one last person. Is that Chris from the Alice Smith School? everyone. Uh, I would just add also having principle-centered or right motives on top of all that has been said. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Okay, our time is about up. Um, you know, somebody said, I guess maybe it was Natalie or, or Natalie or somebody said, 
they focused a lot on the search and they didn't focus much on the transition. <clears throat> the search tired them out and the board members thought at the end of the search, their job was done. They didn't count on the head who they loved absolutely changing his mind and wanting to stay. That completely threw them for a loop. And frankly, they actually didn't believe it. So when things were occurring that were undercutting the ability of the new head to, to function, they still could not believe that the former head would be doing this. It was very uh, manipulative. Um, but the new head has to be very, very politically smart with eyes in the back of his head and building political capital. Uh, and the board, the problem is the board's tired and the board is small and the chair is fatigued. And it's almost like, well, we just went through all of this and now we have to go through something else like this. So kind of it speaks to me as well that the board needs to be large enough. There needs to be enough mix of age and, and energy on the board so that if the energy is all used up by the search, there's enough energy left over for the transition because the transition is crucial to enable this head to survive. And by the way, let's not forget the personal aspects of somebody who comes from another part of the world with their family and suddenly finds out nobody's welcoming them. So all the chairs in the room, keep that in mind. So everybody, I wanna thank you. Edward, thank you for sponsoring this session. Thanks for being with us this morning, everyone. The uh, PowerPoint's available if you want it. And I think there's a recording if you wish it. Ed, any kind of final comments? You still there, Ed? I was going to give Ed a chance to uh, plug just, your code. Uh, thank everybody for coming. And John, thank you for, as always, such an enlightening uh, and fast paced hour, hour and a half. Uh, we always walk away from your sessions uh, wiser, whether we're wise enough to use what you teach us in your session. Uh, the answer is it keeps you in business <laughs> that we don't. <laughs> But I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. And uh, I hope we'll see some of you uh, in Bangkok at the leadership conference. Uh, it's going ahead. It's going to be a great session. But I know this year is very difficult for some people to travel. But uh, in any event, um, more webinars coming up. And I uh, wish everybody a safe uh, and pleasant uh, autumn. And look forward to seeing you next time. John, and and also, I just want to say thanks to James. Uh, and Julia and Andy for leading their groups today. You know, the other case that I read called the Perry case, if you remember that, it might be worthy of a discussion the next time around. How would you feel if you got called by the search firm who placed you to say that the new chair just called the search firm? So maybe that's worth another conversation. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.